Uh, it looks like we did an intro. Still can hear no sound though. second I'm trying to figure out what's going on with my sound because my sound is bad. One second. Because we have a new update. Let's try something else here. Testing one, two. I'm trying to get this sound out of here. Install. Testing one, two. I'm trying to get this sound out of here. Install. Testing one, two. I'm trying to get this sound Well, praise the Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Let's see if I can get this to go. I never had this problem before like this. Audio. Let's see this right here. Facebook. Let's try the sound over here. Uh, hey, what's up, cuz? The bishop from Kaiser. Praise the Lord. Hey, I'm trying to get this thing working. Uh, don't uh, don't leave us. We got a good teaching today. Let me turn this down and see what we got here. Facebook, uh, Facebook. There we go.
Let's get the groups going. Groups. Original church. One second here. Maybe we'll get her going. I think it's good. Is that, is that good? If you feel, if you hear me good, now just uh, send me a thumbs up or something, and we'll know we're doing good. I think we're doing good right now. Uh, is, that, is that good? If you feel, if you hear me good, now just uh, send me a thumbs up or something, and we'll know we're doing good. I think we're yeah, we had a, an update. So when these updates happen, and that's what happens. So let me get this. Uh, Okay, praise the Lord. We are talking about the glory of God today. Again, we're doing a series on the glory of God, and I am more and more convinced that God is about and is doing some great things that I'm going to say that He is initiating. It's not so much the church or the pastor or anybody, anyone else. It is God that is initiating. In other words, He's turning up the heat in the local churches where we as members, I know in our church that the degree of worship in our church has increased, I'm going to say at least 40 percent, where the people, you don't, you know, as a, as a worship leader, you always have to uh, pump the people up to worship and, and tell them to close their eyes and concentrate on Jesus and, and worship and tell them to sing with their heart. Well, I think those days are going now. I think God is himself is causing a, a, an increase in that volume of worship in his people. And so, and, and it's amazing because the more the people join together and worship in one accord, I mean, the more the gifts of the Spirit can operate. And this is what God wants. I mean, this is what, and this is what we need in the body of Christ. We don't need to be uh, in the flesh trying to get God to do things and move and to have miracles and the gifts of the Spirit in operation. Man, it's so good if, if the God himself just invaded each and every service and did and said exactly what, what he wanted to do and say. And remember, this is what Jesus said. I only do and say what I hear my father do or say. And that, that's what we need uh, as a leader, as a pastor, as leaders in the church. We need to hear what Jesus wants us to say and see and do what he wants us to do. And that only comes, and this is what my, my service message today was going to be about, that only comes by spending an adequate amount of time in praying in, uh, by praying in the Spirit. If you're not doing a lot of praying in tongues, I'm talking as a leader now, as your pastor, if you're a elder or whatever your, your title is, if you're in leadership and you're not praying an, um, a, an adequate amount in tongues, you are not going to have that degree of spiritual benefits in your services, okay? You're not going to have the gifts of the Spirit operating like God wants them to. You're not going to have the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge. You're not going to have special faith. You're not going to have these um, um, manifestations in your service that God would have us have. Because, again, like uh, my mentor, Brother Hagen, always says, the door to the supernatural is praying in tongues. And I'll say it again. The door to the supernatural is is praying in tongues. Now, and if you don't want the supernatural, then I understand you can just do what you want to do. But I mean, as a leader, you must desire, the Bible says, desire these gifts. So there's are, these, are, these are gifts that have been given to the body of Christ to enhance the service, to literally uh, a visitor can come in and you can minister by operating in one of the gifts and the, the secrets of their hearts can be made known. Only them and God know their problem. And you can come and operate in that gift and just tell them exactly what it is that um, they need to hear. I remember the story of this couple in Houston, Texas. And um, they, had, they, were, uh, they were a wealthy couple, but they had so much um, finances strewn around. I mean, they had bank account here and bank account there and business here. And it was like a chaos and um, and they just met this uh, woman of God, and all they said they they sat down there, and as soon as they sat, uh, she sat down next to them. She said immediately, the Lord showed me a great big red ribbon, a ball of ribbon, a ball of red ribbon, and she said it was all tangled up, 
and it was all um, um, uh, coming out of the seam and no organization. It was chaos, a chaotic ball of red ribbon. And she just described to that couple who she just met what she saw. She said, you know, when I just sat down, God just so, showed me this over you guys, you know. And, and, um, and then she said, then I realized it was their finances. And she said, I saw God reach into that ball of ribbon and pull it out and everything straightened out and everything was perfect ball of ribbon. And that couple began to cry because they hadn't told anybody. They didn't tell anybody. And God revealed to the woman of God through the gift of the spirit that uh, their situation, their circumstances. And from that day forward, they know that God is with them. He's watching over them. He's given them wisdom. So a lot of these things are done by uh, revelation, spiritual revelation, and um, a wisdom that's not seen, a wisdom that's not known in the natural. Even to the one ministering, in their own mind, they don't even know many times why they're saying what they're saying or why they're doing what they're doing. I mean, imagine when Jesus went to the, the, uh, the boy who could not speak and he spit on his hand, or spit on his hand, spit in, in the boy's mouth, put on the boy's mouth. And the boy was able to speak. Well, I mean, in, in the mind of Jesus, he might have thought first, what is this? I mean, who does this? This is pretty strange. Uh, another time he put his hand, fingers in somebody's ear. And he did many type, types of works that normal people, normal churches, normal organizations would say, you're crazy. That's unheard of. Who does that? And uh, yet it's all about their fruits or all about the results that matter. Amen. And so it's time for the body of Christ. And I'm not just talking in, in this instance about ministers or pastors. I'm talking about everybody from the head to the toe in the body of Christ to start doing the work of the ministry because we are called and we're commissioned to do that. Amen. And uh, again, I can only relate to my services where uh, in our church where we are having a greater and greater degree of the presence of God, or you can say a greater degree of the anointing of God because of the people's willingness and desire to worship. And I think that has something to do with God opening up our hearts to worship. But also this, let me say this, because sometimes people forget about this aspect of, of ministry, is that the Word of God says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Well, if you keep teaching a certain subject in your church, that just produces faith in the people, and they're going to start doing it. Like, for instance, if you keep teaching healing in your service, let's say you have a, a, a month of healing, and, and, and people do that, pastors do that. We, we call it a month of healing. So every Sunday, Sunday morning service, we're only going to teach on healing. I can tell you on that fifth week, on the, on the week after the month that you did your service, I can tell you the faith in the people to be healed has increased so much that they're telling you, Pastor, just lay hands. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. What happened? What what produced that? It's it's faith in the word. Amen. So when you teach a subject um, in your church long enough, it's always going to produce that which you have taught because faith comes by hearing. So whatever they hear you teach, they're going to produce faith. That's why uh, uh, we just had a, in in our church we we lease. Um, our church building to other churches because in Missouri, Switzerland, it's hard to find a building. Well, we have a building and we help other churches um, rent from us. And that brings us income. But most of all, it helps that pastor find, have a place to worship on a weekly basis. And so um, uh, when you when we have with this with this opportunity, uh, we just had a, um, one of the pastors come to us on last Sunday morning and said this. She said, the people don't tithe. The people don't. It was a woman pastor. The people don't tithe. The people don't tithe. Well, when I hear that, immediately I know exactly why they're not tithing. Number one, you're not teaching on it. And a lot of pastors are terrified to teach on tithing or terrified to teach on uh, finances because of what maybe some other preacher has done in the past or robbed somebody or stole somebody. Who knows what their reasons are. But I tell you what, the Apostle Paul said this. He said when he was when he was ready to die, ready to, to go, ready to give up the ghost, ready to be with Jesus forever. He says, I, I have held back nothing. Everything God told me to teach, I have taught. I have literally everything God said to teach you, I've taught. I never held anything back. And therefore, my hands are clean. That's what the pastor is going to have to say to Jesus. 
when he when he meets Jesus face to face, uh, you cannot say Jesus. I never talked about tithing because the people got offended. That's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to teach the word in season and out of season. It may not be in season to teach on tithing, but you're supposed to teach it in season and out of season. Amen. And you're supposed to teach on healing in season, out of season. Whatever God tells you to teach. I remember the story of um, um, a pastor. It was Mother's Day. Actually, this is what's happened to me last uh, this last Mother's Day, last Sunday. Um, um, so it was Mother's Day. And, of course, every pastor on Mother's Day is uh, gearing. I mean, he's focused on Mother's Day. I'm teaching on Mother's Day. I'm getting my Mother's Day poems, my Mother's Day stories, my Mother's Day. Everything is, I'm getting all that ready for Sunday because it's Sunday's Mother's Day. So um, he goes, and he this pastor prepares his message, and he's ready to preach it. And he gets to the church, and it's packed because they notice that, on certain days of the year, it's more packed than others. Like you got Easter, you have Christmas, you have uh, um, Mother's Day, Father's Day. These are days where even non-believers come to church. Uh, and so that was a day, and it was way more people than normal. And the, and the, the pastor was thinking, well, it's going to be good because I got a great summer, uh, Mother's Day sermon. He said, when I stood up, I heard the Holy Spirit say, no, I don't want you to teach on Mother's Day. I want you to teach on healing. And he's having an, in, an internal battle with God on whether to teach on his Mother's Day sermon, which he put hours in to prepare, and or teach the healing. So nobody, nobody knew it but him and God, and he's fighting with God. Lord, you know I, I study this thing for so many hours. I got good poems. I got good stories. I can motivate the mothers. And he's thinking about all the things that his sermon can do to help the people, and, and God was just would not relent and said, nope, I want you to preach on healing. And so finally, he started out preaching in tongues, or preaching in tongues, I'm sorry. My, my, he started out preaching in on mothers on the Mother's Day sermon that he had prepared. And he says, the deeper I got into the message, I can tell God's not with me. He's not helping me preach. I don't feel no unction. I don't feel no utterance. So he said, folks, I, I'm sorry to say this, but I'm just going to go ahead and obey God, and I'm going to do what God says. So he said, turn to the Bible, and he started to turn to his uh, healing scriptures. And he began, and he went through the whole um, sermon teaching on healing. And there were so many healings in that service, all because he obeyed God. And here's the thing. Um, I told our church yesterday, in our prayer meeting yesterday, it's, it's um, many times I have no clue what I'm going to be teach or what I'm going to say. I might have a message, and I always have a message. But I don't, I purpose in my heart that I don't have to follow point one all the way down to point five. Maybe God wants me to, to, to read point three before I get to point one. It's happened many times. It'll happen again because he knows how to weave the messages. It's one thing to have a message and from point A to point Z. But do you know how to weave that message so that everybody in your congregation and those online can receive from the Holy Ghost? And that's why we got to learn to be, as ministers, flexible, amen, where um, we don't have to be set in stone what our book or text says. We can go ahead and do what God says to do. And just, you know, it's, it's called, and I'm sure you know this term, it's called flowing with the Holy Spirit. Or, or we could say uh, jumping into the river of the Spirit and letting Him take you where he wants to take you with that message. Amen. And there's times when he can, I mean, it's happened to me. I've been in ministry now myself for 30, um, on, going on 31 full-time years. And you learn how the how the work with the Holy Spirit. You know, the Bible says the Lord working with them. So it's not just the pastor working. It's not even you when you minister. If you're not a minister or ministry gift or you're not a pastor, when you go out and minister to someone to receive Jesus, um, you, you're not using your own wisdom. You're not using your own words. You, many times you have to just bypass your emotions, your feelings, your embarrassment, whatever it is, and just trust God because He will give you the words to say at the right time. And you don't have to worry about being afraid and embarrassed and all these things. There's also a, a boldness that comes on you when you witness. And um, it's, it's the job of a sheep to have sheep. And uh, if you're born again, uh, part of your commission 
is to go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's part of your job description as a believer, not just get saved and then hold out until Jesus comes, which many people are doing. That's what that's not your call. That's not your commission. That's not why Jesus died for you. Jesus died so that you can go ye. Everybody say go ye. Yes, you are called to go ye into the field, into the field that's ripe for harvest. You, you, you are called to go ye. You're not called to stay ye. And there's a whole bunch of stay ye Christians that get born again. Some even get filled with the Spirit. But don't never go. Don't never tell no one about Jesus. Never witness. Never um, um, profess publicly their uh, confession of, of Jesus Christ. I believe that these things are changing. Now, um, in, in, in my message today, uh, again, talking about the glory, um, I, I'm thinking of, of last Sunday, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reference last Sunday because that was our ser Sunday service. And um, we just begin to worship and um, uh, begin to worship. And the people, uh, and they have to learn to tune out everything else on that Sunday morning and participate in what we call, or what God calls, or Bible calls, corporate worship. And that's when everybody comes together as one. We're not coming together to be one. We're coming together as one voice, as, as the book of Acts says, and they lifted up their voice as one. They lifted up, or they raised their voice um, um, as one unto God. And when you raise your voice together as one unto God, Man, that moves heaven, hell, mountains, obstacles, um, um, impossible situations, circumstances out of the way because the glory of God will be released through praise. The glory of God is released through worship. Amen. And when we get there and realize that it's going to be, I mean, I'm telling you, in our services the last few months, it's just been um, literally flesh, your flesh shaking in this in the service <clears throat> because of the presence of God is so powerful there. And when a non-believer comes in and experiences that power that they cannot articulate, they can't understand what this is. They don't know what it is. What is this? What, why do I feel so good? Why do I feel so peaceful? Why do I feel so um, changed or like something's touched me? And in that church service, that's the way it's supposed to be every service, that that person has experienced such a presence of God that they want it, they want it, they desire it, they seek it, they come back next Sunday and then next Sunday and next Sunday, not because the message was good, but because the presence of the Lord was there and manifested in their life and in their mind, amen, in their heart. That's our job. So in these last days that we're in, I mean, getting can you tell that we're getting in, getting close to the days of Jesus appearing? Can you tell that by everything that's going on and um, all of the circumstances and situations and financial calamities and inflation and COVID and war in Ukraine and um, um, lack of this and supply shortages? I mean, has there ever been such a convergence of such bad news all coming together at the same time? Um, in our day, no, it, we're, we're there now. So there's going to be a need for the church, number one, to be strengthened and to realize that we serve the living God. And I, I emphasize living God, an active God, a God who doesn't sleep nor slumber, a God who is awake and alert, and he has his eye on the, the body of Christ because the, the church is his bride, is his wife. Amen. And so um, I'm talking about Jesus. The church is Jesus' bride. And, but the, uh, you look at Israel. Israel is the wife of God. So you got God has his wife, which is Israel. Jesus has his wife, which is the church. So Jesus is going to make sure that the church is, will rise up to the level where it needs to rise up so that it is full of faith and power and it goes about doing exploits for the kingdom of God. The, 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 um, the motivation, and the motive is to increase heaven and decrease hell as much as we can. Amen. 
So that's our motivation. So in these last days, uh, we'll see an increase both in the presence of God and in um, a, a manifestation of angels, angelic manifestations, angels helping in the service, angels helping in the streets, angels helping on the train, angels helping in the car, in the airplane, more of release of angelic activity. You know, we had prayer yesterday, and while we we're praying for the nations, I begin to see in, uh, uh, in the realm of the spirit, I begin to see so, so, so much activity in the realm of the spirit. With the natural eye, it would seem like God's not doing much on the earth. It's just chaos after chaos, day after day after day after day. No, don't, don't even believe that. Don't even entertain that thought. God is moving. I tell you, if God would open our eyes to see the angelic activity, it has not decreased, nor has it stayed the same way. It has increased multiple fold. And God and the angels are moving on the earth and it's all geared towards one thing. And that is the harvest of the church. Hallelujah. God is, is um, allowing a great harvest to be prepared to come in. And there will be a coming together of the early and the latter rain. This is what God is doing. And um, uh, you're noticing more and more. Of the body of Christ, the, the Christians, God's people, um, are becoming more and more responsible for their own circumstances and own, such own situations where, and what I mean by this is that they don't need to call the pastor, they don't need to call a brother or sister to become strong or victorious over their circumstances. They are learning to rise up and take their, use their own authority, use their own position. Amen. They're seated. You are seated far above all uh, heavenly places in Christ Jesus, far above, far above, far above all situations, all circumstances, all evil, all lack. You are far above. You're seated at the right hand of God. And because you're there, all your problems are under your feet. They're not over you. They're under your feet. Amen. And so um, when we when, and I told our church a, a couple months or maybe a month ago or so, I said this, we're no longer having Sunday services. We're not going to call them Sunday services. We call them Sunday training services. So we're coming to be trained to be sent out into the mission field or the harvest field. Amen. Not just no longer just having a Sunday morning sermon and preach a good message and go home and eat. No. It's time to be trained correctly to be a soldier in the body of Christ or in the army of God. Uh, now, again, a lot of this has to do with uh, praise and worship. And that's our series we're teaching on. Because when we lift up our heads in praise and lift our hands in the spirit and begin to worship God, the Bible says the king of glory will come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, the God Almighty. When we lift him up, the king of glory will come in. And when he comes in, he changes things. He changes situations, circumstances. He changes relationships. He changes bank accounts. He changes uh, closed doors and causes them to be open. Amen. He opens up eyes, opens up ears. He causes his voice to be more clear. He caused your vision to make to become more plain. Amen. This is what God does. Hallelujah. He's working, uh, working, working, working on our behalf. Hallelujah. He, God, will fight your battles for you. Amen. He will bring. I like this uh, part in my notes. He will bring an ease, an easiness or an ease to your ministry and also to your personal life. His angels will be increasingly seen. You'll, be, you'll begin to know this was not fixed by a natural means. This was fixed by God. God moved. Amen. And we're going to see some manifestations of God's glory. You know, it's been put on my heart uh, for the last, let's say, two weeks to um, go and study translations where um, we know Philip was translated. And we have instances in the Bible where um, um, men and women were translated from one spot to the other spot, uh, from one second to the next. And there will be an increase 
in translations in these last days. You could be uh, driving in the car. It may take you eight hours to get there. And all of a sudden you get in the car and you start driving and you're there in 20 minutes. How did that happen? Supernatural translation. Because there's no blockage. There's no distance in the spirit realm. So if God transports you or translates you, um, it's it's absolutely supernatural. Amen. Uh, we, we see that in the Bible. So there's going to be more and more. What I'm, what I'm saying is today is that it's, it's time to see the supernatural of God. It's time for the church to step out into the supernatural. It's time for the Holy Ghost paranormal, which that, what that means. That's we're outside of the natural realm or the natural causes uh, where it's orchestrated by God, orchestrated by the Holy Ghost. Amen. So if you want to be um, um, uh, a, an effective prayer, and I know many of you watch uh, our, our broadcast, your prayers, your intercessors, you want to be a great, great, great intercessor, then uh, uh, learn how to flow from the glory realm. And that's going to be emphasized. And, and again, the, the door, and, and you should understand this one, the door to the supernatural is praying in tongues. It's when you pray in tongues, you just bust open the spiritual realm doors and you're right into the spiritual realm. And you can command things and speak things and see things and know things uh, that you couldn't on the natural side of that realm. So speaking in tongues takes you to the other side of the realm where you can change things. Amen. And you can see things and you can know things and you can speak things. That's the spiritual realm where God wants us to see. Remember last week, uh, uh, yeah, last week we talked about not just knowing God or seeking his face, but also or, or hearing God, just, just hearing his voice, but also seeing him. And you see God on that other side of the realm. And when he opens up your eyes or when you get over there, man, it's uh, I think about the gift of uh, faith where men and women has been raised up from the dead because when they prayed for someone who was dead, they actually saw them standing up alive, well clothed in the right mind before they prayed. All they did was act upon what they saw. Amen. So seeing God um, and seeing the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't see him in the natural, but you see him in the realm of the spirits. Okay. Uh, you're in the spiritual realm. So when we say seeing God or seeing Jesus, you're seeing him in the, in, with your spiritual eyes. You can see them and, and, and interact with them. Amen. So if you want to be a great, great, great intercessor, well, uh, you want to have to uh, pray outside of the flesh. And you got to go into the realm of the spirit. And the only way to do that is praying in tongues. Amen. Otherwise, you're going to be living in a realm of man's understanding, and, and that gets, gets us nowhere. You're going to spend most of your time praying about things uh, that are not correct. In other words, you're, you're spending a, a lot of time praying about something that even God doesn't want you to pray about. Um, uh, uh, real prayer is Holy Ghost-led prayer because you're not smart enough to know what the people need or what somebody needs. But if you pray in the Holy Ghost, He knows. Amen. When you're moving into the realm of the spirit, he shows you what to target. And that's true. Um, and when we pray for the nations, come on, there's over 200 nations in the world, over 200, not 200, over. How in the world do I know what nation to pray for to, today? How in the world do I know what king or leader or prince or uh, uh, president or prime minister, how do I know which one to pray for? I mean, it's it's impossible for one man in the natural to know, okay, today John needs prayer. Okay, today Indonesia needs prayer. Okay, today uh, uh, the United States needs prayer. And maybe it's Lebanon. How do you know? You don't know because you only have, what, 25, 30 minutes, maybe an hour to pray. Well, the only way to pray effectively or use your time wisely or effectively is by uh, having the Holy Spirit help you pray. Amen. Even for your family. You got 10 brothers and sisters. 
How do you know which one to pray for today? How do you know which one to pray for this week? How do you know which one needs the most attention, uh, spiritual attention and prayer is spiritual attention? How, how in the world do we know which uh, brother to pray for, which sister to pray for? Because you got 10. Uh, so which one did you pray for? Do you pray for your favorite one? <laughs> do you pray for the one who just got the job or the one who just lost the job? Well, how do you know which one? Well, there's somebody who knows. His name was the Holy Ghost. And you say, Father, I got 10 brothers. I got 10 sisters. I don't know which one to pray for this week. I'm going to trust you to help me to pray for the right one. And I'm just going to believe you and start praying in tongues and guarantee the Holy Spirit guarantee you're going to pray for the right one. Because the Bible says we do not know how we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit, He knows. Amen? So um, uh, it's amazing. Now, let's look at the scripture here. Second Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 7. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 7. It says this. But we speak uh, the wisdom of God in a mystery. And, and when, I, when I read this, I begin to realize, and I, I mean, I've known this, but sometimes you need to be refreshed. But I begin to realize that when I preach on the Sunday morning or any time I preach, when I preach, I, 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 I'm 1,000 percent positive that I'm speaking many times the wisdom, the wisdom of God in a mystery. Because you know why it's a mystery? It's not just a mystery to the one who is receiving it or hearing it. It's also a mystery to me. Have you, have you said things to, your, to somebody and you said to yourself, why did I say that? Where did it come from? And many times you say, it was so wise. It sounds so good. It was good advice I gave. It was good things I shared. You say, well, let me help you out so you don't get full of pride. That was God. And he helped you because you asked him to help you. So he filled your mouth with good things. And I'm talking about wisdom, with encouragement. He filled him. That's what God does. But remember, the door to the supernatural is praying in tongues, okay? For we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the, so there is a hidden wisdom. How is this hidden wisdom revealed? By speaking in tongues, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So there is a real mystery that can be revealed through speaking in tongues to someone, to someone who is in need, to someone who needs help. I remember the story of this woman who, um, that's amazing. Let me tell you this, and then I have to stop because we're, we're um, getting there. Um, and this lady, um, she was stationed in, uh, in Israel. That's where she lived. And God told her, because um, there was a time in her life that she had ministered. She went over to South Korea to uh, the prayer mountain with uh, uh, Yonggi Cho, and most people know who Yonggi Cho was. He had the largest church in the world. He's now in, now in heaven with Jesus. But she went there to visit that mountain, and she got to know the pastor's wife, Yonggi Cho's wife, personally. And, but but she, uh, Pastor Yonggi Cho's wife didn't speak any English, so this woman, who was American, could not um, understand what uh, the American was saying. So, but she had a brother, uh, uh, not a real brother, but a brother in the Lord, a brother in the church. Uh, I'm talking about Yonggi Cho's uh, wife. And he could speak Japanese because um, when the Japanese occupied uh, South Korea years before, well, many of the South Koreans learned to speak Japanese. So many, even today, many, Jap many South Koreans can speak that language. So she got an interpreter and, the, and, and interpreted for that lady, and they were able to share some things and pray about some things. So, so years later, um, um, the Lord told her, I need you to go back over to South Korea and meet this man that you met before, years ago, you met him before. Uh, and God never gave her the name of this man, never gave her the name of the church, never. And many times well, God will lead you like this. He won't give you the details. The only detail you need is go, <laughs> you know, and then when you get there, he'll tell you the next step. So she didn't know the name. She didn't know the name of the church. She didn't know. All she said, she said, all I remember was he said, my, I built the I started the church and it's between uh, uh, South Korea, uh, Seoul, Korea and another city, which 
which is it's thousands of miles long. So that could be who knows how many churches in between there could be. So she says, I obey God. I got on the plane. I flew all the way over to South Korea. And I got I got to my uh, my hotel room and I'm calling all these people to try to connect to this guy and see who might know him. And I called the first one. Nobody knew him. Called the second one. Nobody knew. Called the third. Finally, um, and I'm sure when because she obeyed God, God is uh, orchestrating and connecting. We call it divine connection. He's connecting people together. So uh, in the end, and I make the long story short, she was able to contact that pastor. And the pastor said, yeah, I remember you. I surely remember you. I even told you I started the church, you know. And she says uh, uh, to him, God told me to come over here and give you a message. And he says, what message is that? And she says, well, the message I God told me to share with you uh, about what to preach, uh, what to preach on in your conferences. And God even gave her a word, and it was, it was a uh, Japanese word, not South Korean word. It was a Japanese word that this guy could understand. And she said, you were to teach on this. And, and, and he, was saying, he, said, he said to her, you know, I've been praying. I'm hit it, hit it for a conference today. I was praying about the message. I don't have anything yet. And now I know what to preach on. He said, God has been sharing, me, sharing with me about these things. But I said, there's no way this could be God. And what it was, the message was, is that in order for Japan to experience a revival, there's going to be some worship in some some worship and uh, worship in uh, song and worship in dance, and this is what God told him to teach on, and he be, and be, and she confirmed that. So when he started his conference, he began to obey God and to teach uh, on his conferences around that area on worshiping God. And dance, and you, and you, you have to understand. Um, now, I was in, I've been in South Korea, I think, three times, and now the South Korean people are very. I mean, I was at a church in South Korea with my wife, and we uh, we actually slept in the church for seven days, seven nights, ate in the church, had service. I would say uh, three times a day, and you're talking about people being loose. They pray at 3 o'clock in the morning until 7. We did, my wife and I did all of that. We saw a group of people. And I, then I realized, no wonder South Korea was such a Christian nation and had that big prayer mountain, the largest church in the world. I mean, they pray. They are free to worship God. They were open. They were not ashamed. I mean, nobody, even the kids, I was amazed. And, and, and one of the things that God wanted uh, to be taught was, Teach the people to worship. Teach the people to dance uh, before me. Because when you do that, I'm going to release my glory over that place. And if you would do a contrast between North Korea and South Korea, and remember, they're all related. They just got, during that, the 40s, they had that, that war. Um, and, and there's a, a demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. And I've only been in the South part. And, and, and they're all related. They're brothers and sisters. They have ancestors. They have the same blood, uh, same culture. One serves God, one doesn't. And the big difference is the ones who serve God are receiving the blessings, the benefits of God in heaven, and the other one is not. Amen. And because the glory was released in the south, they have blessing. The glory was not released in the north. There's no blessing. Amen. There's just poverty and death and, and sickness and disease. In the north, so the glory changes a nation, changes an atmosphere, changes bodies, changes finances, changes spiritual atmospheres and fruits and all the people and technology and it's amazing. Uh, everybody knows Samsung and everybody knows um, uh, Hyundai and all of these are South Korean nation, uh, 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 South Korean inventions or uh, products um, that that are used worldwide. Because it came from that Christian culture, from the glory of God. Amen. So we're going to see more and more of that manifest in the days that we live in. And so, uh, again, I recommend you, this is going to be your, your way out. Uh, and when I mean that, your way out of the natural, but your way into the realm of the Spirit is by praying a lot in other tongues. And we always say in our church, the more you pray, the more you know, the less you pray, 
the less you know. Amen. So we're going to trust God to give us such a desire and hunger. I pray for you right now. Father, give them, give us all a, a spirit, Father, a, a yearning, a hunger to pray in the spirit, a desire, a strong desire to pray with the Holy Ghost, Lord God, so that we can include him into the affairs of man. So, Father, I pray, Lord, for a fresh infusion, a, a, um, um, a river, fresh river, that would spark them, Father God, to pray more in the Spirit, to desire to pray, to desire spiritual gifts, Father God. I pray for them right now in Jesus' name, and I thank you for it. It's done. Amen. Well, you know what? We're out of time. God bless you. I think uh, you're awesome. You're living in such a strategic time and such an exciting time in the world right now. And you don't have to hold on. Oh, just just hold on. No, you don't have to hold on. What you need to do is be victorious every moment of the way. We're not holding on. We're not holding on until Jesus comes. No, no, no. We are aggressive. Amen. We're taking ground. We're the violent. Take it by force. Amen. We're grabbing every enemy, uh, every enemy and every uh, sinner and snatching them from the jaws of hell. And we're bringing them into the kingdom of God with the help of God. Amen. Well, God bless you. We are going to see you on the next broadcast. You have a wonderful Sunday coming up, and we'll see you on the next one. God bless. Mm-hmm.